Now we're here at a very nondescript site. and You wouldn't know it, but this is probably one of the most pivotal points in American military history. The Overland Campaign in 1864 has just stepped off. And en route to Spotsylvania, General Lee's army has intercepted the Army of the Potomac en route further and further into Virginia. Now we're standing at the headquarters knoll. And this isn't the headquarters of the Army of the Potomac. This is the headquarters of the armies of the United States. late April, I'm deciding where exactly I want General Meade's Army of the Potomac to invest the Confederate Army, which is holed up in the mountainous area to the west of this area, Mine Run. I've ordered all the, all the armies to uh, begin movements across all the sections of the country on May 4th, including General Meade's Army of the Potomac, with two crossings of the Rapidan River at the Germana Ford and Ellie Ford. And the goal then is to get through this area called the Wilderness, which is thickly wooded, densely forested, 80 square miles. My plan is to get 120,000 men through that before Lee's 80,000 have a chance to leap on him. And I want to draw Lee off his mountains where he's hoping to defend into this open ground near the town of Spotsylvania Courthouse. It doesn't quite work that way, that Lee waits till half the army is through and then brings his men out, his, his corps, to come out and hit the army in midsection which erupts into a tenacious and vicious four-day battle near the Wilderness Tavern. And here, Grant is supervising, in a way, uh, General Meade, who is officially in command of the Army of the Potomac, but there's also the coordination of the entire war effort, not from Washington, not from a desk, but from here in the Virginia forest. So. Now that we're here at Wilderness, can you kind of explain that relationship with Meade and, and the role of now a lieutenant general supervising in the field? So that'll tie into probably answering a question. When you say this is the headquarters of the Army of the United States, that means the Supreme Commander designated by the President, all of the functions of that office in Washington are done here through telegraph and dispatch to to manage the fighting at every other section because the order came between the second and the fourth for all commanders and all the other uh, sections to step off the same time that Meade's army is coming through here. So all of the forces are attacking and we're having to manage that from here. On top of sitting on Meade's shoulder to ensure that the Army of the Potomac carries through with that same aggression that they've not shown in so many other places that they need to carry the fight. And the goal here is to get from the landing site through the wilderness into open ground because 20 miles that way is Lee's army and to draw him out into open ground because he's set and poised defensively anticipating that the army is going to come at him and everybody knows if you want to fight a defensive fight from higher ground. So now that there's been an engagement on these two roads, what sort of direct supervision was required at the time? The direct supervision, it's a gentle way of saying it, comes because of the failures of the Army commander to see the situation and act on it, in my judgment, fast enough and decisively enough that there comes a time that it's almost like if there's an orchestra conductor and is not doing it right, somebody comes in front, don't direct it this way, and then stepping back and, okay, do it again every time, or a chef's not stirring the right pot at the right time, and now you go ahead and do it, and no, that's not where I want you to do that. So it becomes increasingly frustrating from my point of view because I expect me to do those things and he's entirely frustrated because he wants to be left to do it the way he wants to do, but it's not to the, the wishes of my overall design. And I have to manage that. There are two roads running east to west and there's two runs two running uh, north to south and the armies will converge on those two points not knowing exactly where and not having proper ground to truly fight here. Lee understands that better than most because he knows the terrain. He's from here. 
And my goal is to get through, but as, as a wise commander knows, is to ambush in the middle of a force. And that's what he wants to do and hold us. It seems if he can hold us and bring the rest of his army up, then he can have a crushing blow on Meade's army. And I'm anxious to get through so that doesn't happen. This is a multi-day fight. It's a, it's a contact fight. There's nothing strategic about this location other than it's where the armies meet. But there is an overall goal, and that's your job to, to keep the army focused right. on that. And as I told Lincoln, all the armies will fight the Confederates on every front so that the Confederates are not able to support anybody anywhere else. And Lincoln's understanding of that, in his colloquial farm, farm boy way, he says that the way he sees it, if you can't skin the leg, you hold it while someone else does. And what we're looking at is, are we skinning here or are we holding for someone somewhere else? And the question comes at the end of this, are we going to continue skinning or will we just simply hold and, and maybe pull away from here? And that's not in my nature for this. Lee's army is the objective, as I tell Meade in his orders. Wherever Lee's army goes, so will you. His army is what you're after. I want the armies broken. And the uh, traditional strategy has been the places theory, influenced by our training at West Point. And if you hold the place or you, uh, you go out of place, then you have to leave men there to hold it. And you don't have as large an army to fight somewhere else. And I want Lee to think that our objective is his capital because it's going to draw him out to defend it, which means now the army's there for me to do exactly what I want to do and break it. I don't want to have to fight and hold a place and have him come to me then. I want his army out and aggressively coming. So if I can invest Richmond on the way, the other hope is as we move, we're going to constantly wear Lee's army down and, and piecemeal break it apart so it becomes extremely weak and ineffective. So we're here to ensure that happens. I'm frustrated that Meade's not doing it to to the speed to which we've become accustomed in the West. So we're bringing our Western doctrine into a place where they've always had a scrap and they pull apart and sit in their, their corners and wait to be cold to, told to come out and slug again in the middle of the ring. And I'm not used to fighting that way. I want to keep brawling. So we've taken that little bit of the West out East. In some way, yes, and they're not ready for it. So the successes in the West, we've, we uh, have developed a certain bravado about them. But conditions are different in the West than they are in the East. Can you explain some of the difficulties inherent with the Army of the Potomac that aren't just the, the frills and the kepis and the parades? First is considering the size of the Army, 50,000 men in operations in the West, and now I'm, I'm dealing with a force double that size. So that decreases our maneuverability to some degree. It also creates a longer tail of logistics support. And different terrain is another factor that comes in. And personalities of commanders is another thing that comes in that Meade staff is constantly reminding our staff of that regard that this is not the West. Our conditions are different. The Army has been bred differently in its attitude as well. So we're dealing with all of that factor together and the friction just from that alone before factoring in what Lee's reaction will be because every, the, every side has a say-so in the plan of the battle, whether they they've written it in or not. And the logistics are a little bit different when the West enjoys railroads and the river traffic. Absolutely. What, what has to happen to move things here? Well, this, this, the scope of the transportation. Rail, rail cars carry a greater tonnage than wagons pulled by horses. The boats carry an even greater tonnage of all. And nearly everything has to be done on the roads here. So everything has to be moved by animal power at a slower and lower tonnage rate. Now, once this engagement is decided, there is a decisive moment. And I think we're going to go to a new location to talk about that. Here at Wilderness, we're on another innocuous spot, seemingly innocuous. This is the overgrown Germana Plank Road. And though you wouldn't know it, there's no sign here. One of the most electrifying moments in American military history, and military history anywhere, occurred right here in May of 1864. Take us through that night after three long days of fighting here at Wilderness. Take us through this moment in history. The evening of May 7, as the armies are, well, the, the Corps are being formed to come down through the turnpike, the orange turnpike, heading somewhat north and east, 
We come to a junction with the Germana Plank Road, and I dismounted Cincinnati and looked this way and, and took in the, the directional point of it and waited for the first units to come and directed them onto this road, stood by Cincinnati and pointed on the Germana Plank Road, which will connect to the Brock Road, head to Spotsylvania, and further south, which eventually would go towards Richmond, which to them is the goal. But the important point is the Army is not going on the turnpike, which will lead us back to Ellie Ford, Chancellorsville, Ellie Ford, and eventually Fredericksburg and safety. And this is at a point where the Army, after fighting like they have for three solid days, they've been accustomed after hard fights to turn, lick their wounds, and, and refit. I've decided that we're turning and continuing on. And we're here at that crossroads. This is the absolute crossroads. And road, people, yeah. you know, soldiers, officers of every rank, think that you're about to turn. <clears throat> well, they back know we're it. they know we're coming to the crossroads. The question the army has that don't know us from the west. The question they have is, are we going home? And the answer is, we'll go home when it's over because we have more fighting to do. And the most surprising and I think poignant thing about it is the troops themselves are first to realize that they begin cheering as they're being encouraged by me, literally, move along, boys, move along, this is the way. And they begin cheering. Caps are off. They've just been bruised and bloodied and near beat here. And I'm not letting them go home and rest. Hey, let's go have more. We're on our way to more of that same thing we just had here. And they're cheering for it. Because now they're saying that the army is being put into motion for what it's built to do and fight the rebel army and not go back. So they themselves feel that perhaps Grant has that, that uh, confidence in us that we're going to continue. He's not discouraged by our fight here. He's emboldened to carry us forward. And they appreciate that more than anybody. They're, they're cheering. Their brass bands start making their noise. And I have to quell all of that because my fear is that that noise will carry here at night. And wherever Lee is out there wondering where we're moving, he'll start to understand if they're cheering is a reason for it. And it can't, be, it can't do well for his army. And would give him the clue that we might be moving further into what he sees, sees as his country. So what a pivotal moment to be able to see the actual choice to go back north or to head down this road towards Spotsylvania. Absolutely. If you, if you were to seek Providence's guidance, you might ask, well, where is my sign? What should I do? There's no premonition involved about, well, I see the road, I'll know which it is. It's just instinctively, I don't even have to think anymore. This is, this is where we're going. So is this the way? This is the way. That's my voice.